Hi, I'm Ed Sparrow. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Global Foundries with Ashish Malhotra. He's going to talk today about the 14 nanometer process, uh, why you would move to that process node, what some of the challenges are, and what needs to be available in order to make that work. What are some of the big trends that are driving engineering teams to look at the 14 nanometer process node right now? Over the next four to five years, there are going to be two large-scale trends which are going to be only be pervasive. There is there's a fair amount of agreement that there are two large-scale trends is there is more people, more mobility and more connectivity that is associated with the mobility trend. The second thing which is important is the amount of bandwidth that is going to get needed as more people are, are connected, it's going to put more and more stress on the infrastructure that is needed to support this bandwidth. What this means for that is that when you are going to tackle the next generation chips to serve the infrastructure needed to, to serve this demand of mobility, connectivity, and bandwidth, is really there are going to be three things which are going to be important. The first is power. I, I think more so in, uh, in this particular generation of app set of applications than probably any other times in the infrastructure that we've seen, that power will remain, will become a very important, more significant factor in this equation. The second is performance. All the chips rationally which is needed to serve this particular the infrastructure market, they, they need a higher performance. So you need to have me on a uh, on you need to have the right uh, performance level to be extracted from the process node to tackle as the uh, the bandwidth grows from 100 gig to 400 gig and terabit and beyond. So as you continue on that march, whether on the compute side of the equation or into the infrastructure in the wired and wireless infrastructure supported. You need an efficient uh, uh, power envelope combined with the, the performance envelope. And the, the last one, I think, is, is it needs to be at the right intersection point for cost. For To support this demand, you need to be at the, at the right intersection between power, performance, and cost. So who moves to 14 nanometers? What type of company? What type of chip? Well, what are they trying to do with this? Right. So uh, simply, if you look at it, whether it is, so two, three sets of applications immediately come to mind. So uh, the, um, some of the compute applications, right? clearly in some of Global Foundry's customers are moving towards the direction for doing the next generation server products or the chipset that is associated around the server products. That, that's what's there. Then you move in and you say is what is the chips, the chips that are going into the wired um, networking applications. The routers, the switches, the data center switches, which is needed. And the third one is, is the wireless infrastructure. So on the base station end of things, whether it is on the radio or the baseband, that set of application, the chips that are going to serve that, they, they fit on that. And then there is a set of product line extensions from this uh, high to mid end, the sweet spot, to where you can also think about certain low end applications, maybe for the small cell market. They're also starting to think about certain applications which will drive that. So if you're working at this node versus the previous one, what's your expected time to produce a chip versus what you had before. Is it equivalent? Have you gotten that, that honed down to the point where the process is now refined and you can expect the same kind of yield, the same kind of uh, uh, time to market? All right, another good question. I, I think uh, if you look at the generational switch, so clearly you get better performance and better power envelope from as you move from the 32 nanometer process node or the 28 nanometer road to the 14 nanometer process node. I think what you've got to think about is, uh, in, in, is a couple of different dimensions. As you're trying to integrate more, the 14 nanometer process node gives you an opportunity to integrate more. Does that push, uh, push forth your, uh, does it uh, put any pressure on your design cycles? So today what we are seeing is clearly is the customers are trying to maintain what their design cycles were in the 28 nanometer process node. So I think that certainly is a care about what you've got to start thinking about as you staff up your organizations. But then it's coming more from the level of integration that is possible and, and having the right process technology to, to swing across the set of applications that you want to target. The, another aspect which is also important here is that the 14 nanometer process node is actually is very stable. I think we, we achieved 14 LPP qualification in the third quarter of 2015 and we're on track to hit volume production in the 2016 timeframe. So that also gives people a set of capabilities that the foundation of the process node with the intellectual property is in place. So what they've got to think is that as you integrate more, clearly that can put pressure on the design cycles. So they've got to think through that, but the, but the 14 nanometer process with the expertise around the ASIC, um, ASIC set of resources uh, coming in from load foundries and the intellectual property set that's coming in is, gives them a good risk mitigated path towards implementing the next generation designs. 
One of the problems that 14 nanometers, and particularly with FinFETs, uh, fit the FinFET generation, is that you do have to deal with much more dynamic power than you did in the past. How much of that is included in this process? How does that get sorted out? Um, so we're actually seeing uh, that the 14 nanometer process node, when you took a balance between the um, between the static leakage and the dynamic, it actually serves out very well and is very well power optimized. So I, I'm not sure if that is as big of a problem. Actually, the problem statement was more about you had to hit a particular power, power envelope for these chips, and the 14 nanometer FinFET node as a balance between the as a cum between cumulative between the dynamic and the leakage solves that problem pretty well. First is the area. Just moving from 32 nanometer down to 14 LPP, uh, from 32 SOI to the 14 LPP process node, um, it gives you about a 55 percentage area reduction. Um, obviously, all these metrics they vary from design to design, so this is an average representation of an ASIC design. The active power there's about a 50 percent reduction, and when you, if you look at the leakage, it drops by about 85 percent. So clearly, when you look at the the balance between uh, the area and the power you get a tremendous amount of benefit in terms of just the, the am uh, amount of area reduction and the, and the total power reduction that comes forth by moving from a 32 SY node to the 14 LPP process node. So Moore's Law is still very much alive and well in this transition? It, for this particular transition, for sure. At the same time, I think the, the fundamental problem that exists is, is really around uh, the serving the bandwidth for the set of applications. When you look at that, then that is where some of the applications around two and a half D start to make a lot of sense. So where clearly where we're seeing is, is a transition where the ASIC plus the memory solution, the more you can have it integrated together on a two and a half D solution, brings forth a very unique set of capabilities. And in this, I want to talk to you about two set of, set of things where you'll see how the IBM microelectronics acquisition plays well for the customer set that we're trying to target to manage this high bandwidth um, interface between the, the memory and, and the ASIC solution to, to complement that. So first is the IBM Microelectronics solution had a lot of expertise around the 3D packet solutions. If you can see some of these public announcements that have happened with Micron, so clearly there was a lot of good set of capabilities that came in. Global Foundries are uh, by, uh, by itself has been investing in the 2.5D side of the equation probably for the last four to five years. So now, when you can we can you can start we can enable multiple paths of integrating the ASIC with the memory, either in a three D stack or in a two and a half D stack. So I think that's another set of capabilities where really the Moore's law starts to complement what you what you can bring forth in the application set. Does the fourteen nanometer process work with the two and a half D as well? Is that something that you would do better than say a, a thirty two nanometer process? What do you get out of that? I, I think it is, it's really is a combination of the system level bandwidth, right? So on the 14 and the maturity of the ecosystem that comes with it, right? When you look at the set of applications, first is if I want to target a high-end switch application or a high-end packet processing application or some, something that is associated with doing an ASIC for the wired infrastructure, just to pick an example, or you want to do more non-monolithic integration on the wireless infrastructure. First, you've got to think as to what is the set of, uh, set of drivers that are enabling that particular level of integration. Then you might try to know what is the process node that brings forth. So really it's not a question of 32 nanometers, 14 nanometer. 14 nanometer by itself gives you the right power performance and cost envelope to tackle these set of applications. With now with the ecosystem coming forth around the 3D and the 2.5D, it gives you an opportunity to serve those applications. And just to be uh, to give you a little bit more details, the 3D technology that we are in, uh, we have we brought forth into volume into um, into the ecosystem really was focused on the 32 nanometer process node that we've extended further beyond into uh, into the 14 nanometer process node. So you're really looking at a platform uh, style approach to this. Absolutely. We what we want to bring forth is a set of capabilities, whether it is around the first is obviously the process node. Then it is the capabilities around integration of the two and a half D, and do you have all the set of you know, set of qualifications in place? Then you have the set of intellectual property that's needed, and then you have the right set of partnerships in place in a collaborative ecosystem to bring forth this platform to market. So you're trying to you're really put forth is are you giving enough to the chip designers, enough tools in there in the toolkit of MSA, so as to bring forth the right set of the right solutions in a risk mitigated manner to the market. Another piece of this is what have you done on the interconnect side? Uh, is it an interpose or is it a uh, organic inorganic interposer? So there are multiple paths. 
Uh, one of the paths that I can, so I can talk about is at the moment, and we're, we're going to continue to look at multiple paths. The first and foremost that we're bringing forth on the 14 nanometer, obviously, is a, is a well-defined chip package interaction qualification plan on wire bond, flip chip, as well as the silicon nanoposite. And then we continue to look at certain very high performance DT, deep French capable interposite technology that came in from the IBM side, as well as on the organic and the laminate side of the equation. The ASIC offering at the moment is productized, for, for the moment is, is productized really around the silicon deposit uh, technology for two and a half D set of applications. So what markets do you see taking a look at a, instead of a planar chip, a two and a half D chip? I, I think, uh, so there is, is clearly the two sets of applications which are Maybe three. So I think when I talked about early in the conversation, there was a set of applications on the compute side of the equation. There were a set of applications on the wired infrastructure side of applications, as well as a set of uh, sort of chips in the wireless infrastructure across the board of the three segments that the 14 nanometer ASIC uh, offering, the FX14 ASIC offering is targeting. We are seeing an active interest from customers across all the three set of uh, applications. So there's a lot more creativity going into, and a lot more unknowns going into the next version of these chips than have ever been there before, right? I, I think yes and no. I think every process node brings forth a, a set of, as the applications transition, it brings forth a set of unknowns with it. I, I think the important, so certainly that, that's, the, that's the no part of the way. Yes is surely, we, did we have two and a half D as prevalent or as active of a conversation, or three D as active of a conversation on a few generations back, now, so certainly, so it's a combination. But I think the most important thing is how you're bringing forth is two things: a complete solution set and a risk mitigated path. If you can enable that, people will feel a little bit more comfortable to exercise the right um, right solution set to bring the next generation applications to the market. One thing that happens when you start moving to two and a half D is you've improved your throughput and you've also removed some of the components that may cause problems, such as analog IP, for example. Does that make 14 nanometers for you a longer node and one that has more durability than it would normally? We, we certainly feel uh, 14 nanometer can be a long node for the industry. I think as in the two and a half D capabilities around non-monolithic integration certainly can, can further extend the life of the 14 nanometer process node. So certainly I think it totally makes sense and that's, that's really where we are geared off to, to invest in not just the single chip module, but also the two and a half D of the 3D capabilities around 14 nanometer. What does this do for chip design when you move into two and a half D versus say a, a, a shrinking features as we've been doing for years and years? Yeah, so, so certainly there is one set of applications which, uh, which move from an evolutionary path of single chip module and on say an N plus one generation process node moves to the N generation and N minus one. What the two and a half D does is it changes the paradigm of the thought process. It gives you a level, it gives chip designers a level of creativity to better integrate, better split the die, better put forth um, uh, the memory plus the chip together. So it gives you a better set of options to fully utilize as well as fully think about other non-traditional set of, set of ways to tackling the set of problems that we're faced with. We've been talking about 2.5D for quite some time now. Why now? I, I think it is just about making sure that we have the right set of tools together and is the ecosystem matured enough so as to get these to the market. So I think it's just from Global Foundries, if you think about it, we did, we had a very active advanced packaging between IBM Microelectronics and Global Foundries, we had a very active advanced packaging um, roadmap. I think it is now at a point where it is certainly is, we, we, get, we are at a point where we can reap the benefits of that, of that volume that we've seen. We've seen the maturity to happen. We've seen the, a, lot of this, a lot of the relationships in the industry to be, to be present, as well as a lot of the intellectual property is now a part of our roadmap that we can execute on, that we are executing on. Does it change time to market? If you have a two and a half D and you have a platform architecture, you can reuse many of these components. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. The thing is the more, I think the first and foremost thing that chip designers look at is trade-offs. They look at a trade-off when they're trying to, they, absolutely, you want, you want to exercise the next most feature-rich set of uh, things in your next generation chip. But what you want to do is you want to balance it out with what is the optimal trade-off that you have in your mind. Do you have, are you going to start from scratch, which puts more risk to the equation, or do you uh, have as, as much of a library or a platform approach where you have all the things that are needed for you to be successful, whether it is in the packaging, whether intellectual property, or the ecosystem that is needed, or the test, is it all fairly well-defined so as to be able to exercise the creativity that you need 
with the right chips, the right feature set in the chipset. So certainly having the right platform set allows for reuse, it allows for a distribution of uh, the investment amongst multiple customers, which most other cust most customers like to like, like to also utilize. Ashish Mahotra, thank you very much for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.